but apart from memory there are a few other aspects to cognition there is thinking how we think what we think you know uh, what's the speed of our thinking uh, how we develop our thinking and then there is another aspect which is perception uh, perception is of uh, various kinds uh, we normally perceive in terms of uh, you know our five senses but the aspect that i will be interested in is visual perception so that's going to be a major part of the presentation today visual perception all these cognitive uh, faculties you know uh, our memory our thinking our perception helps us to communicate in big and small ways so we first deal with the first one which is memory now uh, when we say memory right many many things can come to our minds when we say memory uh, what happens is that we often hear things like you know oh somebody has a great memory they are able to remember and learn whatever they see so we've often heard terms like photographic memory you know you see something and you remember it right uh sometimes we talk about memory in terms of you know memory loss people losing their minds they they do not remember they do not remember events of their lives past events of their lives they cannot recognize other people they cannot remember names and things like that so memory pretty much in fact we say that memory pretty much is a fundamental aspect of our existence uh whatever we know about ourselves our our childhood our adulthood you know our youth is all made up of memory in fact uh, when we have a uh, midlife crisis okay this is again a phenomena in psychology which is often discussed people look back at their lives and gauge and try to assess what they've gained and what they've lost you know metaphorically so what comes to what comes to use memory whatever flashes they have in mind about what happened to them the positive experiences the negative experiences so memory is a huge part of our cognition it helps us to remember things it helps us to recognize and it helps us in every day activities you know to process things on a daily basis to understand the environment but one of the basic things in memory is we should remember memory is dependent upon attention attention to particular stimuli so when i say attention to stimuli what i mean is how much focus are you giving to something in the environment it can be words it can be an image right which is in psychology is known as an icon it can be uh, it can be an auditory image uh, which is known as an echo like right now when i'm speaking uh, it's psychologists would say that if if Uh, somebody is paying attention to what i'm saying it is a uh, auditory attention in the form of an echo so there are multiple ways in which there is visual attention in the form of words there is also visual attention in the form of images which are called icons so our memory is largely dependent upon the attention that we give to a particular stimulus or stimuli in the environment and nowadays you all will notice that nowadays since there is there is so much again digitalization there is so much in on social media there is so much information that we actually use the term information overload we are being bombarded with information of all types you know so it's actually a little hard to focus it's hard to focus on what is more important what is less important what should i give priority to what shouldn't i give priority to right so here what comes in handy is attention what we pay attention to can potentially become part of our memory okay what we pay fleeting attention to may or may not be part of our memory how does how does memory work once we've given attention to something uh how does memory work uh 
if we give attention to something for about 10 to 30 seconds, right? Half a minute till about that time. Uh, information can be stored in our working memory or something which is known as short term memory. And only if that information is extremely relevant, will it be stored for a longer period of time. Anything which is beyond 30 seconds is, is uh, clubbed under the term of long term memory. So whatever we know as, you know, birthdays of people, anniversaries of people, uh, certain things we might remember from our past, uh, you know, uh, certain things we might remember from academics, okay, some particular kinds of information that we uh, have given attention to, all that becomes part of our long term memory whatever we've remembered. And then if it becomes part of long-term memory, we tend to remember it pretty much for an extended period of time, maybe even a lifetime, right? Uh, but, but the interesting thing is, and here is what, you know, uh, is a small little practical suggestion. Uh, as teachers in academics, we often are made to believe a small thing a child who is able to memorize things correctly and reproduce them on paper, right, is known as a good student. Why? Because they remember everything. They remember everything that was taught to them. But uh, this criteria, I believe, should be changed. Why? Because we are measuring a person's intelligence and academic ability solely on the basis of memory. This should not happen. So a small thing that I often do, you know, uh, to, to uh, know about people's short term and long term memories is uh, for long term memory, you can talk to the students, ask them what's important to them, what they remember. For short term memory, there is a small experiment okay, uh, in psychology, which I often practice with the students. And that is, I uh, might give them digits, you know, some, some numbers. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a five digit number, and I ask them to write it on paper, and I tell them fold the paper, then I make it a six digit number, I add one more digit, right, then I make it a seven digit number, an eight digit number, I keep increasing the numbers, right, till, till a particular point till they've done it, let's say five times, six times, seven times, this particular exercise. And then I ask them, Let's find out how many of you actually remembered the numbers. We can do it with numbers, we can do it with words, we can do it with whatever. Right? So it's on basis of this that I always tell them that you might have good memory, that is great. Even if you don't have good memory, memory should not be the sole basis or the sole yardstick for deciding your academic intelligence. Why? Because somebody might be very good at thinking. Somebody might be very good at, at uh, uh, processing information, at analyzing, but they might not be very good at memory. Memory is helpful, but what I'm trying to say is it should not be the sole basis for our, our educational assessment, okay? which it normally is many a times. The next thing that I want to discuss with you all is a concept which is related to memory, which is called memory and forgetting. right? Uh, this has been discussed by psychologists, primarily people like Ebbinghaus, right? In fact, in psychology, we have a, a term called Ebbinghaus's curve, which basically in simple words says that uh, if information is given to us right now, if after this particular lecture, somebody asks you to point out, you know, what was spoken in the lecture, because of the immediacy of the situation, because of the recency of the situation, right, or the lecture, you will remember the information. But if I ask you the same information, maybe after two days, you'll remember a little less. If I ask you after some more days, maybe a week, you'll remember a little less. So the idea is, in forgetting is, we tend to forget information that is not available to us on a daily basis, until and unless it's extremely important and we've learned it up, then it's in our long term memory. So, uh, but all kinds of information is not relevant to us and all kinds of information cannot be part of our long term memory. So, so forgetting is a natural, natural process. We tend to forget information that is not recent, right? Uh, 
and i'm sure for all of us this curve of forgetting or this this curve of remembering right is a uh, separate separate in the sense that all of us have our own ways of remembering and all of us have our own ways of forgetting information and what we remember what we forget okay or the rate at which we remember the rate at which we forget but the important point to learn from this is from forgetting is that uh, because forgetting happens memory becomes important and retrieval of information becomes extremely important so two three ways in which we can remember information two three ways in which we can retrieve information are these psychologically first is a concept which is known as mnemonics mnemonics means if suppose we have uh, 20 points to a concept right or 15 points to a concept 15 features or 15 points or something like that right it's always better to club them under particular particular sections right so what we normally do in mnemonics is let's say if we have 15 points we will create a name a particular name right and uh, where each alphabet okay stands for one or two particular points now when we don't need to remember those 15 points separately all we need to remember is we need to remember that particular name so let's say uh, if i am if i am uh, you know it's a history class and there are certain certain dates certain events i need to remember so i make a mnemonic for you know a particular word i create my own word for it okay like uh, a b c j f g something like that a stands for two points b stands for two points and things like that what's going to happen is i don't have to remember the points separately i need to remember this particular mnemonic a b c g f g and when i remember the mnemonic i will gradually get the points back in my mind this helps students who are not very good difficult it's difficult why because we have not simplified it if we simplify it for the student they will remember it because it's a easy process right so uh, that's one way of retrieving information and not forgetting okay uh, the second way is in memory is the second is uh, by uh, something which is known as you know uh, location retrieval cues that is the way and the environment in which somebody learnt up the information forget learning up also learning is a you know a higher order process even reading the information the way somebody the environment in which somebody read the information if the person is able to recreate that same environment it will help them to understand and to memorize and to learn or to retrieve the information so let's put it this way something as small and trivial as this that if somebody uh, was sitting and reading a science chapter and they were having a, a cup of tea sitting in their room chances are sitting in one corner of their room chances are they should actually when they are rereading the science chapter go and sit in that same corner of the room and have a cup of tea psychologists say it just might help us to retrieve that information if we forgotten it or it might just help us to understand the information better so retrieval retrieval becomes very important right because memory is directly correlated to uh, learning fortunately or unfortunately it is right uh, but here we may need to make a distinction between uh, two kinds of learning uh one is rote learning right where children just reproduce the, remember everything and reproduce the information as if they are regurgitating it right and uh, you know in the educational setup it's the, those children are considered very very bright and brilliant why because they've remembered everything and written it down on paper and the second kind okay the second kind is non rote learning where we process think analyze grasp the information and then write it in our own words 
so our our uh, work as teachers should always be to motivate students to if they can to, to motivate students to move in the direction of non rote learn why because if they do not mug it up so to say they don't learn it by heart okay chances are they will remember because they've understood it and then they've remembered and one way of understanding is what i've just talked about is mnemonics another way is you know creating that same uh, location or creating being in that same environment doing similar things when they were reading it for the first time right another thing which becomes important in memory is which we should know which can help us to communicate okay is uh, apart from memory being long term and short term uh, we can have memory for uh, particular skills and episodes like certain episodes in our lives all of us will remember you know very very distinctly clearly uh, we can also have memory for skills like driving is a skill we've practiced it again and again and again right uh, but we can also have something which is known as encyclopedic memory encyclopedic memory means what encyclopedic memory means that uh, i have information extensive information about a lot of topics right and sometimes this becomes useful for students so so we should actually train students and tell them something as simple as this do you need to go in depth into a particular subject study it in detail right like we do in research phd or mphil right or do you need to know extensively do know about a lot of topics right but at a uh, let's say at a base level not too much in depth right so we need to we as teachers we need to be aware of uh, both short term long term memory we need to be aware of what what is involved what is relevant for our students whether it's you know they require memory for skills or do they require encyclopedic knowledge uh, what are the ways it is normal to forget what are the ways in which they can remember or recall information all this becomes extremely important why because it helps us in two ways as teachers you know or if we are working in an organization uh, one uh coming back to the point on empathy if people forget we would be empathetic we would not be negative or unnecessarily critical about it or harsh about it and secondly we can actually have tips to help the person right, right. another point right. Right. another point that i wanted to make before going on to something else right in in cognition was one small point was uh we all remember that the brain is wired in such a way that the neurons in the brain are connected they are interconnected it is not like you know one part of the brain is not connected with the other part they are totally connected so one way of building our our memory circuit so to say is through constant practice and constant practice does not mean you know many a times we hear people say this that uh, you know i sat for 7 hours 12 hours to study not really relevant what is relevant is you might sit for 15 minutes but give undivided attention because remember that's the first thing i said about memory memory begins with attention so if we give undivided attention to something even for 10 minutes 15 minutes we have created an impression in the mind we just need to practice that and the memory will become strong from memory we now move on to thinking okay how we think so uh thinking the first thing that i'd like to say about thinking is uh we the speed of thinking per se we can think uh, in you know slowly we can think very fast also uh it's always better to think a little slowly why because slow does not mean i do not mean uh, the speed of a tortoise i don't mean that but slow means you thinking you analyzing your understanding and then moving on to the next concept there are many times when we come across people who say that you know uh, i think very fast the problem with that is even though it can be appreciated right the problem with that is that if you thinking too fast your thinking might be jumbled thinking might be haywire it might be a little disorganized why because we are jumping from one concept to another to another to another so it's from one thought process to another and to another and to another right 
so thinking a little slow taking time to think taking time to absorb information is always better because it helps helps us to develop cognitively it helps us to think in a balanced way in a rational way right now uh that's the speed in which we can think but here i'll be talking about apart from speed i'll be talking about thought content what is it that we can think and how is it that it can help us to communicate better so the first thing in thinking is right in thought content is concepts we think in terms of concepts right uh concepts about anything and everything for example right from our childhood we have learned information in terms of concepts information about people you know these are our parents our siblings our grandparents right information about objects right or things in the world this is this is a car this is a toy okay uh, this is a table this is a chair right or information about animals a dog a cat an elephant a giraffe all these are concepts in our minds and how do these concepts develop these concepts develop in a hierarchical manner you know what we in in um, again in research call as conceptual hierarchies and conceptual hierarchies are very very important not just in language acquisition in the way a child learns a language but also in everyday living why because let's look at it this way a small example uh to a small child if we introduce the concept of a dog right normally we'll point out to the dog and say look here this is a doggy and we have a particular way of speaking to children right look here this is a doggy this is what is a doggy what is it and we'll keep repeating okay right it is only when the child is able to recognize that we actually say that you know uh, there are introduce the child to different types of dogs that here here is a german shepherd and here is an alsatian and here is a labrador and things like that okay so the hierarchy is this we have the concept of animal under animals you can have many animals but dog is an animal and under dog you have types of dogs this hierarchy is pretty much there in all the information that we remember in science we see this very often you have you have a phenomena you will have a definition for it and then you will have its subtypes right so as teachers this becomes important for us this is the way concepts are arranged they are arranged in particular ways and patterns and when i say ways and patterns what i mean by this is conceptual hierarchies why because why does this become important to us as teachers when we know this right there are two things we can while teaching arrange the information in a hierarchical manner simplify it and arrange it hierarchically so that it becomes helpful for the student to learn okay design it in the form of a flow chart okay or if not use the chalk and blackboard method to talk, to uh, explain it or to discuss it if not that just explain it explain it in terms of you know there are three levels or there are two levels right because uh, like i pointed out uh, in today's day and age especially during the times of the pandemic it becomes extremely important to simplify the information for the student the information the student already has in fact they can download all the books and get all the information we are the human element to point out and explain and be the bridge the link between the student and the information so conceptual hierarchies help us to understand that information is organized in hierarchies and we can do that to help our own students another thing that's there in conceptual hierarchies okay uh is we learn through we learn through definitions or through something which is known again in um, technical language known as ostentative definitions ostensive definitions this means we learn through pointing out through here and now the example that i gave of the child the child is shown a doggy and said this is a doggy right so for information that is that is uh, that can be pointed out that is here and now it's easy for information that is not we need to well hierarchically arrange it right for our students 
apart from this okay a typical way of thinking or understanding is called prototypes prototypes are also come under concepts but prototypes are let's say a specific kind of concept right prototypes actually mean uh, when we are talking about uh, the typical member of a group typical member of a group right that will have typical characteristics so again uh, we can have a prototype of a chair a chair will be you know like a plastic chair or a wooden chair you know that has that has four legs fine right? uh, a bean bag is also a kind of a chair something that we sit on or recline on okay but it's not a prototype similarly a rocking chair is not a prototype of a chair because all chairs are not rocking chairs right so one very useful way of teaching children information is providing them prototypes telling them that this is the information and this is the typical example for it this is the way it is arranged they will think faster they will understand things faster they will grasp things faster right so that is that is uh, concepts and that is prototypes one more way of thinking okay is through something which is written here as mental constructions that are relevant in understanding the world right these mental constructions are called schemas schemas okay like we have a scheme scheme or a plan similarly we have a schema right and uh, schemas were studied by uh, originally they were studied by uh, someone called uh, frederick bartlett in 1932 uh when he was studying you know uh, the trauma of war patients what they remembered right but from there from the 1930s the research on schema has obviously progressed and expanded and now we know that we can have these constructions about uh, people about events even about texts books texts that we read right so uh i'll give you a typical example and then i'll explain how they can be relevant in teaching right uh one of the things that i often do in my class is uh if it's a new batch i will always ask them this question you know uh what do you think a teacher is or what do you think a teacher should be a good teacher right and then they'll tell me all kinds of qualities and this and that etc etc and then i'll tell them this is your schema about teaching right and then i'll ask them what do you think teachers are actually so then they'll tell me you know nowadays teachers are this they do this they do that so i tell them this is your th- this is your schema about what teachers are actually right so you have two sets of schemas right and then i will tell them schematic constructions are very good at grasping information help us to help us in understanding the environment why because uh we have schemas consciously or subconsciously about people you know how a teacher is how a doctor is how a parent is right we also have schemas about events right with that are known as scripts uh, these are schemas where uh, we are you know for example we go to a restaurant okay we have a schema of what is going to happen in the restaurant we will go sit talk look at the menu order food the waiter is going to take the order it's going to take t- some time then the food's going to come once the food comes we eat uh and we pay the bill and then we go home right this is an event schema okay now uh once we've explained once we we ourselves know what a schema is right? we can help our students to learn the information that is in the text better why because we can arrange it and tell them that you know this information is about a person this information is about this process remember there are four points in this process a b c d this information is about an event or a phenomena remember this is how it happened it has particular particular stages or particular steps right and uh, we can always give examples to students that are relatable that are relatable relatable means things that they understand things that they can relate to things for which they already have a schema right so one one thing that i sometimes do again okay in my classes is this a uh, 
if i have to teach them a new concept okay about about uh, let's say i have to teach them a new concept or a new something about a new author or something i will try and first talk about something that they already know i have to teach them b i try and t- talk to them about a something that they already know and then i say okay now you know a this is b it's somewhat similar to this right these are the things in concept b right so they they can be related a and b can be related and these are the points of differences so things become faster things become faster why because i do not start off by saying that you know here is the information b is about this 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 and this i don't say that i start off with a relatable concept i start off with a schema that they already are aware of so schemas are quite helpful in knowing right another way in which schemas can help us for example if you can have you know text schemas text schemas would be you know uh, very very common in uh, writing in fiction or in non fiction we know what every genre is about right for example we know what what a typical typical uh, film you know would uh, contain a typical let's say action film or a typical horror film what will be the ingredients okay so if i if i give them an essay on that to read let's say a horror film okay or or something about an action film they already have the schema in their mind so they'll be able to read faster but if i give them something new something let's say about another country something for which they don't have a schema let's say i give them something about uh, red indians native americans right then the people who lived and and have now been well reduced to a minority in in the united states right uh they are not i cannot expect the students to know about those people and about that culture so before before i give them something to read i actually tell them that this is how these people lived this is what happened to them this is how they ate these were their customs this was their culture so what am i doing actually i am building their schema or i am building their concepts okay and then i give them the text about it so one one typical way of helping students learn information to process things cognitively is the best way is before giving the text before actually coming to the technical concept okay it's better to talk about the concept a little bit give a background to it in any subject it might be geography it might be history it might be science right we can always relate in science schemas become very relevant why we can, we can always talk about concepts and things that the students know that are similar or dissimilar right something that they can relate to okay. and then go on to the actual technical concept so this is how thinking thinking can be arranged in concepts is arranged in concepts think uh, concepts can be prototypical right and we also have schematic constructions to help us to communicate to help us to read write speak not only are they helping us but they are also helping our students because ultimately the students are if you see in all this you know in memory and in thinking uh, the we are speaking the students are listening right it will help them to read maybe it will help them to write whenever they write so somewhere or the other basic communication skills are getting involved with with you know these small small uh, practices you can say cognitive practices the next one is something which is i had discussed as perception and uh, perception i had said is of various types right uh, we perceive through our five senses but uh, one of the points that i've written below is you know uh, we perceive information uh, through hearing you know in the auditory manner right uh, that is there truly there right we can okay but uh, the most the most the strongest form of perception is visual perception right we might hear we might not hear okay but vision is something which is very dominant we will always see even if it is for a second and the simplest example of this is when you are going on the road and there is traffic right and there are public announcements being made how many of us will actually listen to the public announcement not really but if there's a huge hoarding or poster for a second that can catch our attention so when it comes to you know a, a, let's say a competition between hearing and vision 
the auditory perception and visual perception visual perception usually wins hands down so visual perception is is a a, a very important let's say uh, ability faculty in communicating right and it helps us directly directly in reading and in writing directly in reading and then obviously in writing right why because uh, we can train ourselves our own selves and even our students and when we are working in a team in an organization you know we can help others also through particular strategies particular reading strategies let's put it this way these strategies are things like this uh depending on the goal depending on the aim of what kind of information is wanted depending on what we have to do we can read right for example uh if we are looking for specific information and there is there is there are like 50 pages we don't have to go through the 50 pages line by line we can just skim we can just skim look for particular information right another way of doing this is again uh let's say we have a a talk or a presentation tomorrow and again we have 50 pages right and we don't have the time to go through all of that we you do we don't want specific information but but we want an overall understanding of how things are going so you know look at the first page quickly second page third page look at the last two three pages okay look at something that's given in the you know in the middle let's say at the 20th page or the 22nd page something so you'll get a general idea look at the headings only so you've scanned the whole document you've kind of seen it but you've not read it in great detail right so looking for specific information is one one strategy right uh looking for looking for uh, sc- uh scanning the ho- entire document going through it not in great detail but you know or uh, in a cursory manner is another another strategy so they're scanning they're skimming apart from that there is another one okay the more we read uh, the more we have the ability to predict or oh, this is this is what is given we know what's going to follow you know there can be only two three options there okay like we can predict what's going to happen typically what's going to happen in a film oh now this is happening now i'm sure you know this is what's going to happen to the hero or this is what is going to happen to the heroine like we can predict there we can also predict information as an in academic information what's going to happen there okay but prediction the uh, our skill of prediction okay uh, is increases with visual perception with increases with more reading more practice in reading right so there are particular ways in which we can read and there are particular ways in which we can help our students to read we can actually tell them that this is what you have to do you want to prepare for a viva do this if you don't have too much so much time you want to uh, you want to prepare for a presentation you can do this okay also apart from this another way in which we can help our students communicate cognitively is uh, helping them understand the difference between uh, reading fast or reading slow right which basically means uh, i i what i'm going to talk about is uh, speed reading or silent reading right uh often often we say you know if you speed reading you are reading several words per minute several words okay uh, normally you can read about i think um, i'm not giving the exact figure just an approximate maybe about you know 70 80 words per minute 60 70 80 words per minute you know and maybe a little more but uh, if you're reading fast you're reading like much more you're reading many many words per minute 120 130 words per minute maybe 140 50 words per minute okay and i'm giving a conservative figure the figures can be higher right the actual figures can be much higher right uh because this is a rough estimate that i'm giving yeah so uh the question is is speed reading relevant for our students is speed reading relevant for us uh it can be relevant it can be right uh, but the idea is uh, when we are speed reading we should always remember that we need to aim for global understanding global understanding means we need to aim for what is in the text if somebody asks us what's in the text we should be able to say this is in the text 
if we cannot say that then speed reading is becoming useless so for ourselves we should be able to gauge that if in a minute you know we have read one page okay or more than a page and then you can close the book and then ask yourselves do you know what's actually happening in that one page or one and a half page if you know it then it's helping you then please continue if you don't then read slower and this is how we should tell our students that it is fine somebody can read fast somebody can read slow whatever it is as long as they aiming for global understanding for overall understanding of a text another thing is in contrast to speed reading is something which we call as silent reading silent reading is quite helpful right uh, but for silent reading we need you know concepts a few things like this for example uh, silent reading will be will be enhanced if uh, we do not have uh, distractions in the environment you know external factors uh, you know if we don't have noise proper ventilation proper lighting and things like that okay silent reading some people are naturally naturally silent readers they would tend to read read uh, a text uh, silently to themselves while some others are naturally loud readers they're reading aloud they tend to remember information and they read things aloud okay some some students are oral oral uh, performers they will listen to what you're saying right once they've heard it listened to it okay uh they will remember the information right while some of them are kinetic kinetic means they will tend to write down that information so depending on what our student is okay we should allow them to be that we should we should allow for that kind of flexibility people learn through hearing they learn through writing they learn through reading aloud they can or speed reading they can learn through silent reading whatever whatever suits them as long as it is helping them so that is the bit on on uh, visual perception when it comes to the bit on audit, auditory perception i had said auditory perception comes you know a tad behind a uh, little behind uh, visual perception okay um, like i just pointed out right now some some of our students can be auditory auditory performers that means they tend to hear and and uh, understand the concept right so uh, that is also one way of help Uh, one way of learning information but uh, one small uh, tip is if somebody is a is you know into silent reading or reading aloud or writing or being in you know uh, somebody who is engaged in uh, auditory perception hearing and then learning information right uh, like i pointed out that we should allow them to follow you know what they are comfortable with but at the same time we should also introduce them to the other other aspect somebody who's reading slowly we can also say why don't you when you're reading slowly why don't you try to write some of the information down or why don't you once say the whole thing aloud to yourself why 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 do we do this you know in a very simple way why do we do this okay why because brain the brain is created in such a way that the more senses you use for communicating the faster you are able to memorize and the faster you're able to communicate the better you're able to communicate let's put it this way so uh, if you are interested in silent reading you should also be able to use your hands and write the information and read that information aloud once so you're hearing the information so what you've done is you're not only using your eyes but you've used your hands tactile right uh, perception and you've also used uh, you've also used speech hearing whatever you saying you're hearing so the more senses you use the better better uh, you are at you know cognitively grasping the information and the better you are at grasping the information the better you will be able to communicate it you might have to say it you might have to read it you might have to write it whatever it is right so we need to tell our students that the brain functions in such a way that the more you practice the more senses you use the more there is interconnection in the brain the faster you will uh, remember the information the more enhanced will be your learning right and for a longer period of time you will remember that information okay. but again like i said memory thinking and perception obviously includes understanding here i am not talking about rote learning right because i am not a big proponent of rote learning because when in rote learning students just regurgitate the information what i'm talking about is meaningful authentic 
learning that is based on understanding understanding concepts understanding the information right in things like that our perception helps the faculty of perception helps the faculty of you know memorizing looking at the information hearing it speaking it reading it helps and obviously knowing the concept understanding the concept helps right so now we will talk about some particular strategies to boost our communication through our cognitive abilities the first one that i mentioned is called multitasking right and the answer to this is no right a lot of people will say oh i'm a great multitasker while well, you are deficient at learning and at communication if you're a great multitasker why because uh, there is a there is a word that we have right a word uh, in our indian languages right in in sanskrit and hindi which is known as ekagrachit ekagrachit means one pointedness whatever we are doing we should do it with one pointed attention we'll do it quicker and we'll do it with more depth and more understanding so multitasking is a big no no right if you want to function to the best of our abilities if we want to be productive we should not multitask we should actually do one task at a time right for one small example i can give you uh people will say you know i listen to uh, again this is an example from students you know i work best ma'am when you know i'm writing something and i'm listening to music you know so my answer to them is you writing neither are you paying full attention to the writing nor are you playing full attention to your music so you are actually somewhere listening to the music and somewhere paying attention to the writing it's a much better if you can actually just listen to the music listen to one song two song put it down and then focus on the writing so multitasking is not a great idea one pointedness one tasking is very good for for our cognition and for communication the second point is something that i've emphasized a little before that is global understanding for everything we should aim for a global understanding global understanding means an overall understanding of information or the text right we can uh, also aim for you know specific understanding understanding specific points under it remembering them right rightly so okay but uh, i can give you research on memory okay a research done by uh, you know researchers like uh, lombardi et al okay uh, they pointed out and they have shown that uh, participants in the experiment remembered the summary of the information but they did not remember the exact form they did not remember the information verbatim so they were given some kind of information they were asked to remember it for some period of time they were given a distractor task or you know a gap in between and then after that they were again asked the same information and what was reported was that uh, they remembered the gist of it the summary of it but they did not remember it verbatim so summary means you are aiming for a global understanding so normally what i do with my students is i always tell them that you know this is the topic and these are some of the basic points basic points means this is the basic just the basic summary of the topic after this you can get into the nitty gritty of it and i will explain the nitty gritty also to you all okay and the material is also given to you but please remember the summary first what is it about if you remember that you will automatically be able to read the text right that doesn't mean that you know as teachers we are not there to clarify their doubts or to you know point out specific features in the text or points that is there but the basic point is uh, if somebody is good at summarizing they are using their cognitive ability in in the right direction because they are able to aim for a global understanding they are able to they are able to understand the text in an overall manner the next strategy is understanding our our uh, target audience in the age and this is needless to say obviously we do especially if we are uh, speaking or uh, when we are uh, writing because uh, if we don't know the audience and we don't know their background you know in terms of their age or whatever you know uh, or their profession professional qualification or some some little bit of information okay uh, we would not know uh, how to uh, let's say um, uh, how to present the information how to how to provide them uh, what would be the you know the most important or most relevant for them 
another one is uh, memory boosting strategies i've talked about mnemonics already the next one is something which is known as inferencing inferencing means uh, again okay here here we need this ability in our education system it is not it's it's quite lacking actually okay why because like i pointed out we uh, tend to you know in our educational system we tend to point out and say that you know oh somebody who remembers all the information is a very good learner no somebody who is able to analyze somebody who is able to infer somebody is able to understand things that are not directly stated are good at learning for example you've taught your students a particular topic now there are two ways in which you can ask them a question you can ask them a direct question or you can ask about the same information indirectly the ones who are able to indirectly answer the questions that you've asked indirectly are much better at learning and they are actually intelligent why because they have understood the topic in such a way that whether you ask them a or b or z or whatever about the topic they will be able to answer whereas somebody who's just rote learned they will they will get flummoxed if you ask them an indirect inferential question because they they do not they do not have the ability to think they would be like you know this was not in the course this was not in the syllabus so one thing as teachers we should aim for you know in terms of cognition and in terms of communication is teaching our children inferencing abilities teaching them to understand a text in multiple ways and to answer the question in multiple ways not just be straight you know have a straight jacketed way of thinking and performing in the exams that's not that's not being intelligent right that's not using our cognitive faculty to its optimal level okay another way in which you can help communication and cognition is through something which is called association building uh this is very good for developing vocabulary uh this is also very good for developing you know our general understanding of a topic so if i if i let's say i want to teach uh, in medical sciences i want to teach something about blood okay the circulatory system okay uh, i give them the word blood and i ask them what comes to your mind tell me so they they'll say multiple things you know blood hemoglobin blood anemia they might say blood circulatory system okay they might say blood can be related to cancer blood related to multiple things so at the end of it i have many words to that to that particular one word i've built an association right and then i start teaching then i say that you know this all these connections will help us understand the concept of blood and how it's there in the medical sciences how it's there what kind of diseases are caused what what can be what can be uh, the etiology for it what is the pathology for it you know and uh, what uh, what all when we say blood what all actually is is subsumed under it okay the you broad concept of blood okay so association building becomes very important uh, one example that i can give from english in association building is i give you a word and i ask you what comes to your mind so they'll give me related words okay they can give me synonyms they can give me antonyms they can give me something that they remember that's relevant for them either ways if i am building an association and i'm talking to them about words through association chances are they if they do not remember all the association they'll remember at least one or two and that is the most important thing why because we tend to remember things where our associations are stronger in fact all of cognition is about association building you know building an association about you know with that particular information either by reading it or by speaking it aloud okay or by or by doing it silently or by writing it down whatever it is so all of learning is association building okay another skill that i like to point out is is again related to association building is something which is known as uh, mind mapping you know something which is uh, which has been quite popularized in in uh, the new new version of the new series of uh, sherlock holmes okay uh where uh, the detective sherlock holmes gets into his mind palace to solve particular crimes now mind palace means how you arrange that information mentally so uh, we as as learners cognitively you know all of us are learners because we're always learning something or the other at some point in our lives we as learners cognitively will not forget the information or will tend to remember the information faster if we have associated it and created a mind palace for it like you know this particular quality is related to this 
or this information is related to something else right if we draw those relationships we draw those associations in our mind we will tend to remember faster if especially we draw associations about new information to already existing information in our mind information that we already know if we if we do that uh we would tend to remember the new information why because we linking it to information that we already know information that we are already familiar with right and the next one is something which we call as critical reasoning or critical thinking right and uh, this can be related to inferencing here right why because when we say critical reasoning and critical thinking uh, it means the ability to uh, not understand things in terms of its face value in terms of what is given on the surface but in terms of multiple layers of meanings in terms of you know why is this information given what does the author mean by this what is the author trying to say is there some kind of a contrast in this text can i link it to previous information that i know can i question the author whatever the author is saying i do not agree with do i have my own reasons for saying that you know i do not agree with what the author is saying so basically thinking thinking in terms of critical reasoning obviously is requires critical thinking but critical thinking in terms of what in terms of reasoning in terms of challenging the information in terms of questioning the information in terms of understanding the background of the information why the information is given why something is given and something else is not given that is critical thinking and and in the west obviously we have you know proponents for critical thinking like uh, paulo freire and ira shaw right but uh, and there's a huge pedagogy that is based on it critical pedagogy but in our everyday classrooms you know we are as teachers we are limited by time and space the syllabus to be completed there are other administrative work uh, duties that we have to perform etc etc so uh, we can my attempt would be to say that we should introduce critical reasoning and thinking in our classrooms right uh, and teach our chapters according to that but even if we can't do it we should teach our students to think critically to to read that they you know that they are given with their that they are presented with because that helps us to think right it helps us it's using our minds it's using our brains uh to discuss it it's using it's using our speech it's using our hearing right and even to write down their points for or against it right here you, again we are using uh our hands kinetic movements right so there are multiple multiple faculties multiple um, uh cognitive faculties that are being used there so these are some of the some of the you can say some of the uh, ways in which we can boost uh, learning or cognition or thinking and now if anybody has certain questions or you know certain suggestions they can open the floor is open Yes. Anybody wants to ask questions? No, ma'am. No, ma'am is the answer. No, no, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's a wonderful session, madam. Thank you so much. And what is you know, why why we are gone for communication? Uh, uh, is that no? The communication plays a major role in emotional intelligence, by the way. Yes. Yes. In fact, uh, you... sir, I can I can expand on this and say it this way. If uh, one of the basic things in emotional intelligence is using our cognition how we think yes. how we can use our you know mind and ultimately our emotional intelligence and our cognition is fundamental to communication we can't communicate if we are not empathetic we cannot communicate if we do not use our cognition properly if we cannot have a proper proper sense of memory we cannot think properly we cannot you know read or understand things visually we will not be able to communicate all all of you know emotional intelligence is about communication because we are not we are not you know if i can if i can say this uh, there is a poet in english uh, called matthew arnold a victorian poet 
right and if i quote him i'll say that the no man is an island unto himself we are all interconnected so we are all interconnected through communication some form of the other of communication verbal or non verbal communication so all our emotional intelligence becomes becomes better you know we as individuals become better if we are able to communicate that's what no you know i i'm very happy to see that and most of them that they're, they're speaking is a very nice session by the way because you know what i'm talking about the connection is important and the connection is failing and that leads to lot many uh, problems in emotional eq or iq or whatever you call it ei or ways so is rather better to uh, set it right what you say you were talking about pauses last time yes talking about word selection of words and how do you uh, remind remember okay and you know, you know how cognition process goes by the way yes uh, when you understand how to recall then you understand how do people recall then yes. you talk about critical analysis of that be critical in that you no know, if at all you, know, you speak this way or that way there is a possibility that things may go wrong may go right you no know, that's okay. the go right is good and the go wrong is very bad so yes uh, sir and also because somewhere cognition and eq uh, emotional intelligence are related you know a lot of people say that that uh, we have this divide in learning where you know in in even e- in the social sciences and the physical sciences where where there is a kind of a binary people say that uh, you know either you can be emotional or you can be rational so emotional is you know understood by emotional intelligence or rational is understood by cognition but i always say that the brain is not structured this way the brain is structured in such a way where we need to be rational use our cognitive faculty and have empathy and emotional intelligence so the two of them are related and ultimately they they uh, you know if we can't think for example e- even empathy has that component uh, if we can't think uh, cognitively we can't emote properly and if we don't uh, again if we can't emote properly there is no point in thinking because the thinking is just relevant for us not for the other person so actually if you see there is there is you know if i could i could draw a triangle and say that there is emotional intelligence there is or empathy there is cognition and there is communication and all three of them are linked for our well being and for the other person's well being so we need to understand these three sir your mic is muted andal sir your mic is muted yes sir so uh, if you have time to can throw light on dyslexia uh, yes prob- sure surely sir i can i can i can surely uh, dyslexia is a, a sort of a reading disorder right and uh, when uh, a child is dyslexic there are multiple symptoms for dyslexia one of the common symptoms of dyslexia is uh not even uh, not being able to read the alphabet correctly reading the letters incorrectly you know right that's one of the common symptoms but apart from this there are many other symptoms of dyslexia right people have uh, problems in speaking right people have problems in repetition they can also be stuttering involved in it so there can be multiple reasons one of the things that's very commonly linked to dyslexia is uh, something which we call technically as uh, adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder that means children who are dyslexic uh, if we draw a correlation right this has been measured uh, scientifically in through research but also we can see it through common perception that children who are dyslexic uh, will be a little fidgety will have shorter attention spans will be a little distracted right and often many a times you know i've heard parents who will say you know uh, my child cannot write spelling so he or she is dyslexic no 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 your child is not dyslexic your child is just has a lesser attention span dyslexia is a serious disorder right but dyslexia can be dyslexics can be helped in the wrong run dyslexics can be helped and there are some techniques and tools that i can tell you you know uh, cognitively yes uh, there are some parts of the brain in dyslexia that are a little depressed le- used less proficiently right um uh, particularly the frontal lobe that i talked about uh, but you know dyslexics can be helped with things like writing big letters on the back blackboard okay uh, using uh, uh, you know re- re- repetition of instruction 
and repetition of instruction slowly so that the dyslexic child understands right uh, also you know not bombarding the child with too much homework too much information spacing it out gradually for a dyslexic child is also again very important okay another thing that's very important again why i was trying to point out and i just said this that there is a if i could i could have drawn a triangle between communication cognition empathy or eq was take the example of dyslexia dyslexic students are not like normal children right and somewhere or the other they will feel that inadequacy so as teachers we need to have we go back to the triangle we need to be empathetic to the dyslexic student understand that they are facing a problem we need to be patient with the dyslexic child they will repeat the same thing again and again and again and it can get exasperating for you but we cannot get exasperated with such a child right we need to know cognitively what is dyslexia what are the symptoms of dyslexia and then we can communicate with the child right so that's why there is a very strong link so that's that's the bit on dyslexia madam dyslexia is addressing the tare zameen par film mein artist hua tha acha hua tha ha sir wo that was nice but uh, that was a very again uh, what i you know talked about in the presentation that's a very prototypical representation of dyslexia dyslexia is, is that right but there is much more to dyslexia apart from that but there in that film they just given one aspect of dyslexia and discussed it but dyslexics face many other problems they face problems in this thing they face problems in writing right they face problems in reading many other issues so it's it's a serious thing as you know and that's why we dyslexics we should have special educators for dyslexics madam uh, some people you know you know instead of you no know, when you read a spelling you know you remember a spelling instead of one word they writing they, they change it you no know? so my son is also doing the same thing so i don't know what to do with can you can you have some idea about that no he reads the spelling he understand the spelling he speaks his third spelling but right. when he writes the uh, r 12 l 2 r it's a bit like that no and then then sir it's not dyslexia then i think it's just a little bit of uh, lack of atten attention being a little naughty <laughs> is how i'll put it you know why That's because uh, in dyslexia there there will be problems in reading right there will be problems in writing there will also be some problems in the comprehension they will have you know they they will tend to look at the uh, read the word differently understand the word slightly differently they will also also uh, reproduce the spelling incorrectly uh, so that what, spelling what, incorrectly what, spelling incorrectly only spelling incorrectly sir Uh, the other mm. aspects are fine what i'm saying is dyslexia is inter interconnected all the aspects are interconnected so there will be problems in all the others also okay thank you thank you so much madam uh, yeah sir sriman has a question so yes. uh, good afternoon madam yes ah uh, madam we may have heard about uh, subconscious state unconscious state yes, and yes, uh, conscious state madam yes sir Do age means does age matter or uh, situations uh, affect that part, madam? Can you elaborate? That? Uh, the subconscious, unconscious, and the conscious, right? Age, age uh, matters. Yes, I agree. Age matters. Uh, but uh, the thing is, sir, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, this requires again both both uh, emotional intelligence and both cognition to understand. I'll give you I'll give you a small example. Uh, many a times when we dream. all of us when we sleep many of us get dreams and most of the dreams are irrelevant dreams right that is when your subconscious is pro being processed that's that's there in your subconscious you're not doing it consciously because you're sleeping right uh, consciously um, what we think uh, what we talk about what we believe in right how we communicate is uh, our is our conscious behavior right uh, but one small link okay uh, between the conscious subconscious and unconscious is this there might be something in our experience something emotional something in terms of our thinking something right uh, which we don't like okay and that gets moved because we don't like it or it's threatening to our 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 self esteem right that gets moved to the unconscious and our job as educators for ourselves and for others you know for students also should be to bring that information from the unconscious to the subconscious to the conscious so that the person accepts the reality so that they are they it's good for their uh, cognitive for their emotional well being 
so that's one way of understanding the connection between the three thank you so much madam yes there is one more question here and the question is uh, about uh, the layers of memory uh, and there's another one will age with age we tend to lose our memory in cases any ways of improving them yes there are particular ways of improving memory uh, one is uh, through the use of language you know uh, keeping yourself abreast with uh, whatever is happening you know in let's say in terms of vocabulary learning new words in the language solving puzzles in the language the other is by uh, developing our uh, you know or, or our um, mathematical knowledge in terms of you would have heard things like you know some of these some people play uh, sudoku puzzles and things like that that's another one okay but the third one is neither language nor mathematics the third one is mindfulness the more you keep your mind silently centered for 10 minutes 15 minutes in a day quietly in one place so your the more the mind's connections are rewired and there is actually research to prove this there is lot lots and lots of research you can go in the internet and search you know on google scholar on anything on mindfulness meditation research on that okay it's a new area but the brain is rewired structured structures in the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe are completely rewired right it gives us resilience i'm sure there was a topic here on emotional intelligence one of the topics was resilience right uh, mindfulness gives us resilience to think resilience to live resilience to overcome failure which is very very important so that is one of the ways of improving our memory all this language helps us to improve maths helps us to improve so does mindfulness and there are layers to memory there was this one question layers to memory i i explained layers in terms of you know short term and long term memory in terms of encyclopedic knowledge and you know or or learning skills but if the the writer the person who's written this in chat box could be specific about the question maybe i could explain more what what it was that they wanted to know so your mic is muted ma'am uh, uh, is that okay shall we close it uh, any questions from any uh, participants no sir okay, okay. no and uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am you have something to do speak susma ma'am uh, no sir no thank you so uh, thank you so much uh, madam for thank you and thank you so much for uh, delivering is a good explanation no i i think that there must not be any question because i don't think that i do have any question anyway because because i understood everything uh, you taught us everything perfectly and that is insightful and i'm thankful and hopeful at the same time the the forthcoming events i hope uh, may not be here maybe somewhere else uh, forthcoming events uh, i request you to come and join okay sure, uh, sure, sir. Sure, thank sir. you namaste thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you sir. wonderful discussion thank you thank you sir thank you thank you and we'll be catching up uh, by 2 o'clock today with m srinivas rao all of you please participate and madam uh, if you can join at uh, uh, because we are closing at around 3:30 so yes. you can at 3:20 or something like that i would yes, be yes yes thank you sure, sir thank, thank you. you thank you thank you sir